plus 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 answer. So don't use this as like if you didn't get all these issues, don't don't worry. But this is like everything that I thought was in the question, and I did it in the word limit. In fact, I was actually at five hundred, and I had the word would not, and I made a contraction to wouldn't just to like you know get to the limit. Can we use contractions? Yeah, I don't mind contractions. <laughs> the English teachers hate it, but I, I really don't care. All right, so I'd recommend before Wednesday, if you haven't, take a stab at doing the question, do it, and then come to class on Wednesday. We'll talk about this. Um, this question I wrote, remember, halfway through the semester, so there's a lot of stuff that's not on it, taking, zoning, all the other stuff that's not on it. So come prepared with questions. You can email me in advance if something's bothering you. Uh, but this is for you. We'll take the entire class, and if I have to stay late, we'll stay late. But I want to make sure any lingering questions you have before the exam are answered, okay? Sir? Uh, do you care about grammar or... <laughs> well, don't, don't write like a, you know, gibberish, but I, I, I don't really mind contraction. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we asking like sentence fragments or, or run-ons? A lot of uh, tests, since it's you write as much as possible, they don't care so much about grammar and whatnot, so I didn't know what you I mean, I'd like you to form coherent sentences with subjects and verbs. I mean, that, that'd be nice. <laughs> I, I mean... If you omit words in a sentence to the point where I can't understand it, that's probably a bad thing. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to take off points for run-on sentences. And you know, if your punctuation's wrong, I'm not. I'm not going to care. You're under time pressure. I'm not expect. If you have a typo, I'm not really going to care as long as I can figure out what the word is. Um, yeah, just don't don't worry too much about the grammar. Uh, that took me about an hour, and I really worked really hard. Um, and I actually took my time. I probably could have done it in maybe. 40 minutes if I tried. So, and that's hitting every single issue, which I don't expect you to do. The thing about a curved exam, which you probably will realize, is the goal is not to get 100. The goal is just to do better than your classmates. And it's a disturbing trend. No, it's true, because you're on a curve. There are only so many A's, so many B's, and so many C's. If I was giving an uncurved exam, I would give it so that you can conceivably get 100. That would be my goal. That's not my goal with this exam. I want it to be a nice, natural distribution. If it's too easy, everyone gets effectively a B. And I get in trouble because that's not a good curve. I actually have to fill out these forms. If the exam's too hard, then also everyone gets a B. I like, you know, for there to be some A's, B's, and C's. And everything should just really round out to a nice curve. And in a sample of 40 students, it probably should do that uh, fairly well. Yes? In that example you posted, that would be the equivalent to one essay model on the exam? Yep, there'll be two of those. Yep, there'll be two of those. And the max you can have for each one is 500? Yep, 500 each. That's right. Yeah. I don't think it'll take you much more than two hours to finish, and you have three hours, so you have plenty of time. Um, one thing to, to stress, I mentioned this in the last class, does anyone plan on handwriting it? Uh, a student in the other class asked, if he's handwriting it, is he exempt from the word limits? I said, no. Um, I, he said, how do you know how many words I have? I said, well, you can count them. I, don't handwrite it. It's not to your advantage. Um, someone asked about the, uh, the, the, the exam software. Um, that it gives you a word count for the entire thing you type and not for one particular question. I need to find out about that. But worst case scenario, you can just copy into Word, do a word count there, and copy it back to make sure you're good. Um, that, that, that might be a way around it. I emailed the registrar, and she hasn't gotten back to me yet, but I'm like 90% sure it's OK. I'm, like, I emailed her yesterday. I haven't heard back. She said she was sick. But I, I, you'll, you'll, you'll know as soon as possible, but I'm like 90% sure you're back. You'll, you'll know with at least two weeks for the exam if that's not the case, okay? So if whatever... Yeah, bring in whatever you want. Um, it won't help. Uh, if you did this sample question, you'll probably find it difficult to actually flip through your notes and find what I'm talking about. You kind of just have to know it. Like, there might be a little inkling in a case that reminds you of something we did, and, you know, it'll be close enough that if you know the case, you can figure it out. If you don't know the case, you'll probably not be able to find your notes within a 90-minute span for the question. Because um, you should probably cap yourself off at 90 minutes for each question because make sure you have enough time for each. They're equally, they're equally weighted. They have the same value, so um, no sense killing yourself on one and not finishing the other in time. Hey. Yes, sir? So there's a maximum amount of points for the points? Yes, in, in my own internal mindset, there are certain issues I'm looking for in each issue of a certain number of points. But again, it's a curved exam. I'm not starting from the premise at a perfect exam of 100. I mean, there might be one of you that gets a perfect score and it's every issue I want. That would be awesome. That would be an A-plus paper. 
Um, but that's not my premise. My premise is that based on how everyone performs, I'll get a value of how much each issue is worth. So say if you know 50% of you all hit you know half of the issues, and then say maybe the top 25 hit you know seven out of 10 issues, for example, then I'll know how much those additional issues are worth. So I'm going to first grade it and just see how many issues you hit, and then when a sense of how many people did it, I maybe the exam will be easier than I thought. And do, everyone did really well. Then the issues won't be worth as much because I have to keep on the curve. Um, for the record, I don't particularly like curves. I wouldn't grade on one, but I have to. Um, so that's kind of the system I'm built into. Um, that's what she was asking earlier. Were you um, talking about internet access? No, you won't be. I mean, so 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 the answer, the short answer is yes. You can search the class web page. Okay, mm -hmm. and that'll be about it. Um, I don't want you doing any kind of Googling outside of the class website. The only reason I say the class website is because all the lecture notes are there and a lot of like pictures and diagrams. Um, if you want to print those out or maybe copy that stuff into your own personal notes, I'd probably recommend that. I won't be there when they're administering the exam and I can conceive of problems if someone sees you on a website. Um, even if I tell them not to, I can still conceive that making a problem for you. So you might want to just go to the course webpage and just copy those notes into yours. I mean, I don't type that much, Amy, right? My notes are really pretty crappy. Yeah. So just take whatever you want that you think might be valuable and put in your own notes. Um, again, I don't have a problem with you looking at the class webpage, but I'm suspicious that if a proctor sees you on the internet, like I can tell, I can tell the proctor they can have their notes on Microsoft Word, which, you know, it's easy. But if you're on a webpage with a browser, it might make your life difficult unnecessarily. Do you know as a proctor sits at the front of the class? Do they ever walk around? No. Really? No. I mean, where they would have to stand over someone's shoulder at the back. I've never seen them do that. Um, I wouldn't even bother to touch the registrar. No, I have to. In fact, the, the registrar is making me certify that it's actually an open book exam. I have to actually sign something and give very specific directions what you can and cannot use. Oh. It's actually surprisingly legitimate. Um, it, they're really strict about it. Like I have this, I have this entire form I have to fill out. Of like, do I want one copy of the exam or two? Are using blue books? Or I mean, there's all these questions I have to answer. So I have to spell that in, in detail. So to answer your question, I would just put it into Word. That, that that keeps you safe. There's nothing. My nice website. There's nothing you have to see there. And one of the things you clear. So you you are saying it would be okay for someone to access be on the internet to access the web page. Yeah. Page. Yeah. Just, but it would not be okay to be on someone else's website. No. And no. There would be nothing in the system that's going to prevent anyone else from accessing another website. Yeah. It would be like an honor code. System. Yeah. Then you're on the honor code. Um. What? No. Yeah. I think yeah, because that was like so. Um, class website. So and that puts it on our shoulders to have to say, oh, so and so was, was on the internet, and like that's kind of stuffy. Well, the thing is, if I make it open notes, there's no way of blocking the internet. You understand? The, the, you the, just bring it up. Like other professors allow open book notes. Uh, if, if any of you want to use the notes on your computer in Word, if I allow that, I can't block your access to the internet. Mm -hmm. You understand? There's no, there's no medium. Meaning, once the way ExamSoft works is, it either locks on your laptop or it just puts up uh, an app to type. Um, obviously, if any of you are emailing or searching or contacting anyone else, that's a clear honor code violation. That's not even, that's not even a close call. Um, that, that's that's no good. Okay. You give me a look. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that. Like, I'm not saying that. Well, like, well, then ask honestly. Should I revisit this? I mean, I don't have to use that policy. I mean, I'm not trying to be like a hater or anything, but like, well, can't we just print out? Like, of course, open, of course, you can print out. This is for your convenience. Like in my right, mind, absolutely. it's yeah, it's yeah, easier yeah. to have a, a Word doc that I can do a Control F and search quickly yeah, than to print out 150 pages. Well, let me ask you: Does anyone would anyone want me to lock on the laptop so I can do that easily? It's options. Your options are you can have you can have bring in anything printed out paper I don't care, or not. See, I use that find function on Microsoft Word because going through all those papers after going because we we have the option of open book uh, for our contracts with Kelso, and 
you would see people come in with stacks. I mean, you really just can't go through all that. If you're not prepared, it won't help you. I mean, if, if you're if you're, if you're searching, you're you're gonna fail. I mean, at that point, you're not. I think the point is those people care enough that you've got tabs or. Okay, so no, let me ask clearly. Does anyone have objections to letting laptops be open? Does anyone object to allowing the laptops to be open for notes? Wow, interesting. Okay. All right, then I won't let it. If some of you are uncomfortable with it, then I won't let it. It'll be the laptops will be locked down. Is that your notes? Okay. No iPad, sorry. Yeah, I, I personally agree, but if some of you are uncomfortable with it and, and you know think that it might be taken advantage of. I can't control that. I'm not even gonna be here and I have no faith in that the person I Okay. It'll be locked down. I'll change the policy. Uh sorry. I yep. If some of you are uncomfortable with it then it's easier this way. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll tell the registrar on Monday. What's that? Yeah, print out all of your stuff and bring it all in and print out the website, whatever pages you want. All right. Democracy works, I guess. What's that? Yeah. A few people can always change the system, right? What's that? Oh, it's too late. You can't press the cast ballot. No, you can't change your vote. It's okay. I, I will not, you know. I don't hold anything against it, but if, that's, if you're not comfortable, then I don't want to make anything for others. In fact, I'll actually pose the same question to the day students, see what they think, uh, if they have similar gripes. Well, I have a quick question. Like, no one in your day class? No, you can't go on that one. No, 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 I'm not asking that. I'm just saying, like, if no one in your day class objects to having it open, you're going to let... They're, gonna great, they're great on different curves, so it really doesn't matter. I mean, they're graded entirely separately, so it makes no difference. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but if there's some of your classmates are uncomfortable, then there's not much I, I can do. You'll be at no greater or less disadvantage because the curves can be exactly the same. I mean, whether there's 70 students or 40 students, it can be the same number of A's, B's, and C's. That's what you guys have to kind of realize about curves. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Yeah, can we make a majority vote? No, no, I don't, I don't need a majority. Oh, you just need any students. Yeah, if, oh, one, if okay. one person raised their hand, I would have oh. gone against it. I, did, I only needed one, because I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable. Makes no difference to me. Okay? Fair enough? All right, let's talk about takings, right? So we've had several tests to find whether there's a regulatory taking, right? The first one we looked at was Loretto. This was with the cable. Remember the, the wire and the cable? And the test was whether there was a permanent physical invasion. That one is easy enough because it's obvious. There's a cable nailed to a building. It's there. It's always there. It's a take, right? That one's easy. The second one we did was the Hatachek case. This is one with the clay and the bricks. Remember, they were bringing up the clay from the ground and excuse me, baking the clay into bricks, okay? That was a, a Los Angeles case. And the court there said that because it's a noxious use, it's within the police power. Okay. So here, there's a taking. No taking. So already we're having this kind of tension between when is a government law passed as a taking and when is it just simply within the police power, okay? Those two are kind of easy. If we only had those two cases in our precedence, it would make sense. If there's a physical invasion, it's a taking. If it's just some sort of noxious use, a nuisance, it's police power, right? But then we had to go and mess things up for the Penn Coal case. This was the coal mining case from Pennsylvania. And this was the opinion where Justice Holmes said, we look at the diminution in value and whether it goes too far. It was a taking. Here, we had a case that probably should have been within the police power. In Pennsylvania, a coal company went to mine under a house. By mining under a house, 
it costs subsidence. What does that mean? The house actually drops into the ground and the house can collapse. That's a bad thing. For the most part, we think that um, mining and protecting people from houses collapsing is a good thing. It protects the health of the people, the safety of the people. So that should be a police power. But no, Justice Holmes said, when there's a, some sort of diminution in value, when it goes too far, or in this case, he said that it was completely devoid of value, then it's a taking. Okay? Okay? So if you remember then, Justice Brandeis had the dissent, and he said, no, 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 this isn't a taking. This is simply police power. This is a state passing law to protect people from uh, collapsing houses into the ground. Right? Okay. So now we're already getting this kind of weird back and forth between the various uh, strands of the takings test. The fourth one, and the one we studied last week, is it makes the mess even more complicated, which is Penn Central. This is the uh, uh, building the skyscraper of the railroad, the air rights case. What was the test there? It looked through the dibbies, the distinct investment-backed expectations, and the character of the government action. So, when it's less than complete devaluation, okay? So, Penn Cole said if a taking goes too far and it diminishes the value too much, it's, you know, devoid of all value, then there's a taking. Penn Central said, well, you know, what happens when it's less than a complete devaluation of property? They said, well, you can't build a skyscraper above the train station, but hey, you still got the train station. You're still making money, so it's not a complete devaluation. When it's less than a complete devaluation, we turn to this test. <coughs> and we see, are there distinct investment-backed expectations? Were you actually planning on building the skyscraper? Have you invested enough money in it? Were there expectations that this would go through? Or were you simply just trying to get money from the government for the taking because you lost? You knew you weren't going to build it. Okay? So these were the four tests that kind of permeated. And they're not in any kind of chronological order. Rather, I think these are laid out in the sense that makes the most, uh, makes the most logical sense. The case today throws a ratchet in everything that these cases did. So we have the Lucas case, okay? And let me just show you a little uh, graphic that illustrates what was going on in the Lucas case. Okay. Uh, so here's Mr. Lucas. He buys these two properties, right? Lots 11 and 13 for about a million dollars, right? In the South Carolina shore. Has anyone ever been there? South Carolina shore? No? Okay. Yes? No? Yeah, I came, the, I came the last class fell for that also. Right there, he fell for it, right there. Anyway, you're up. God, we're in the last week of class. You think you'd figure this out by now? I know, I, I have to, I, I change it up. Okay, so anyway, so he has his house here. In the past, there been a lot of flooding. So in 1949, the entire place is underwater. 1968, underwater. 1973, underwater. Okay? So he had bought land where there was frequently flooding. So Tomoka, let me ask you, if the state passes a law saying that we can't allow people to build houses on the shoreline because it's frequently flooding, how would you characterize that law? What kind of law would that be? Well, they're just... What power do you think the state passed this law pursuant to if you ask the state, saying, hey, we don't want your house being underwater? Right. 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 So this is simply saying, hey, we're not going to let you build a house here because, look, every 15 or 20 years, it's going to be underwater. That's a bad thing. Houses being underwater is not good. We have to rescue you. It's dangerous, whatever. Okay? But by the same token, Melissa, when you tell... Someone that they can't build. The guy paid a million dollars for these two beachfront properties. His neighbors can keep their houses. The state didn't say, tear down your houses. It's just saying you can't build new stuff. How do you think the neighbor, I'm sorry, how do you think Mr. Lucas viewed it? Lots 11 and 13. Yeah. And what was it? Right. It was a taking. So if you ask Lucas, he said there's a taking. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Patty. Yes. Yo. Like that. 
How did what did the South Carolina trial court find as far as how much it diminished the value of the property? Okay. Is that right? Later on, they say no. But well, what do you think? Who here thinks that telling Mr. Lucas that you paid a million dollars for two properties, you can't build there? Show of hands. Who here thinks that that made the land valueless? Okay. Who here thinks that it was not valueless, that it's still a value? Well, Patty, why, why is it not so valueless? It's still beachfront property, so you can't build a permanent structure there. There's other options. Like what? In the case of the state center, you can, there's, you can camp on it. A million dollar <laughs> tent? It doesn't have that. It's, it's even mentioned that you could bring, you could bring, bring in a motorhome if there's a, a, mil a million dollar trailer park. It doesn't pay that. You're Mobile home, I'm sorry. But it doesn't make it valueless. It may not be worth a million dollars anymore, but it's not valueless. And you can still go to the beach and have bonfire and cook s'mores. A million dollar bonfire. Well, why not? <laughs> Jamie? What do you think? A million dollars. The million dollars in 1986 also is probably significantly more with inflation. There were two homes there already. No? At least looking at that, there looks like there's two homes. So I mean, they're just well, like, no, no, this is, this is a recent picture because uh, after uh, uh, after they said he, at, yeah, after he said they, he, yeah, yeah. Good. We'll get back to that in a minute. But let's talk about the denominator. Remember we talked about fractions? Mm -hmm. How do you define the relevant interest? Are you defining the interest in terms of, hey, he could still sell the land, he could still alienate it, he could still build a tent and you know bring a, 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 a mobile home, you know, that's value. Or if you ask Lucas, saying, hey, I want to build a beachfront house and sell for a million dollars, that's what I bought this land for. Well, I was going to say, I mean, the property owners can have, let's say, we've got an economic benefit from his property. That can be seen as, you know, detrimental to that property owner. So just to be able to, you know, put the tent, how's that going to help me? I'm still not going to be able to use that from my property. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. just want to leave that night. I want to be able to, let's say, have a garden, grow some vegetables and stuff. Right, right. And that goes to the issue of distinct investment back expectations. What did this person invest in the land to do? He paid a million dollars to the expectation he's going to build beach from properties. So we have this constant struggle of how much, how do we assess the value of the property? Is it simply, you know, they diminish the value of the property to zero or less than zero? And this makes a very big difference. Uh, John, going back to our tests here, remember I put together these, these four tests. If there's a complete diminution in value, which test do you apply? Good. If we're talking about a complete diminution of value that goes too far, we're talking about Penn Coal. John, if we're talking about a less than complete diminution of value, what are we talking about? Okay. So we have two different paths, and depending how you characterize the taking, you have a different path. Now, as a matter of law, the uh, South Carolina Supreme uh, Trial Court is probably wrong. They were probably clearly erroneous. This was not a complete taking of value property because the value is still a property. For example, maybe if, uh, and this happens a lot, the Army Corps of Engineers wants to build a dam so they flood a person's land. That's a complete taking. If your land is flooded, if there's now a lake over your property, you've lost all value. That's a taking. If the state tells you you can't build a house here, that's not a complete taking. So this case... <clears throat> Excuse me. Should have been really analyzed under Penn Central, and that's the point made by the dissenting opinions. But instead, Scalia went off on his own and did, did his own thing. And let, let's get to that. Okay. So what Scalia did was he applied Mahon, uh, Penn Coal. I'm sorry, as you know it. So Scalia applied the Penn Coal test, but he didn't just apply it; he recharacterized it in kind of a, a weird way. Think about how did how did Scalia interpret Penn Cole?
Mm -hmm. Right, right. So what Scalia said was, this totally wipes out the value. It might not be 100%, but it's 95%. In other words, to quote Justice uh, Holmes, it goes too far. It went too far. Okay? So because it goes too far, there's a taking. But there's a big exception to this test. He doesn't simply say anything that goes too far is a taking. There's a big exception. Um, let's jump to Audrey in the back. What is the exception that he carves out? And it's a pretty big exception that's kind of difficult to understand, so we'll walk through it. But what is the exception he carves out? What's that? Okay, then you have the next one. Good. Okay, so let's walk through this. Uh, you said before that when he purchased the land, you, he was allowed to build it, right? So this restriction came out afterwards. Okay. So let's think about this. If any of you buy a piece of land, at the time you buy it, you assume the law as it is now will be going to the future. You know, if you see, okay, hey, I'm going to buy some some property by the beach and look around. There's a house here, there's a house there, a house there. That means I can build a house. The, then the state goes around and changes the law and says, oh, oh, not so fast. No new construction. You can't build anything else new. To Scalia, that's unfair. He's saying that you should not be held to um, be accountable to laws that were not enacted at the time that you bought the property. So what he says is you look to these uh, uh, common law background principles. Okay, so Audra, what, what are these common law background principles? No? That's okay. And Rose? No, I'm talking about the law, not, not, not the parties, but the, talk about the, com, the, the common law. Oji? Amy? Holt? Uh, Je Jeffrey? Like yeah, nuisance law. Nuisance. Like me. Uh, nuisance. So what Scalia said is that the state cannot simply change what it can do to property. The only way a state can take this land without having to pay for it is if it was a nuisance at common law. You're perplexed. They can't change the law? Okay, let me, let me walk this through again. If that, so say a common law, it was a nuisance to flood someone's land. Say if you, you know, built a dam, and in the process of building a dam, you flooded a person's land. At common law, that was a nuisance, and you could sue someone for that. Okay? In Scalia's mind, if the same thing happens today, if the state passed some law that had the effect of flooding your land, then that would have been a nuisance, and it would not have to pay. I'm sorry, it would, it would, uh, no, I said that wrong. Let me start off. I'm sorry. At common law, building a house by the water was not a nuisance. At common law, there was nothing wrong with building a house by the water. In fact, a year before the statute was passed, it was perfectly legal to build a house by the water. In Scalia's mind, if something was legal before a law was passed, a common law, then the state should not be allowed to do it now. In other words, the only, the extent of the state's police power is limited by what they could have done at common law. All right, let's see, we'll put that out. So the police power is limited to what the state could have done at common law. If something was a nuisance 
at common law, then the state could have regulated it. So say at common law there was a, uh, I don't know, a warehouse or a factory that was, you know, puffing up a lot of smoke. At common law, the state could have inhibited that or a neighbor could have inhibited that as a nuisance and enjoined it. So if the state passed a law regulating that, it would not be a taking because they could have regulated it under common law. At common law, it was perfectly legal to build a house by the water. There was nothing wrong with that. So because it was okay to do this at common law, there was no nuisance for it, the state cannot now get away with it. If the state wants to do this now, they have to pay for it. So the compensation is tied to whether or not they could do it at common law. If they could do it at common law, no taking. If they couldn't, taking. Okay. It's kind of a, of, a, of a weird concept that I'll explain more, but everyone just get the general gist. If the state could do something at the common law, then there's no taking, because that's something that the owner of the land understood. When you buy a piece of land, you buy it with certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions is, I can't be a nuisance. So if there's a common law nuisance that exists, and I buy a piece of land, I know, I can't do that, and if I do it, the government will shut me down. But if there's some new standard, which you don't know about when you buy the land, you can't be expected to be aware of it. And because you can't be expected to be aware of it, if you do it anyway, you're going to have to get paid for it with the compensation. The compensation is meant to reward people who are punished unfairly with that notice. If the law changes and you don't know about it in advance, and now your property is worth less, you're getting compensated for it. Or, with the first one, if you know the law is a certain way, and then your property gets devalued, too bad, you should have known better. It's all about notice. If you have notice, you're not going to compensate if the law changes, because you should have been aware of that. If you have no notice, and the law changes against you, you're getting compensated for it. All right. Here, yeah. How? Same reason that the law was passed. Like I thought, the police power still existed, so the police power was good. Good. So I'll answer your question in one second, but first, let me say that on remand to the South Carolina trial courts, the, the trial court found that a common law building a house by the beach was not a nuisance. It was not. What the effect of the Scalia opinion did is actually very significant. It froze in time, if you will. If you remember Jurassic Park, remember the little mosquito gets stuck in amber? It froze in an amber? Scalia effectively solidified in amber the common law. He said if there was some sort of nuisance that existed in the 17th and the 18th and 19th century, that's it. No new nuisances are allowed to be created by the legislature. So, for example, uh, regulations about you know, cigarettes or asbestos or you know nuclear weapons or various things that didn't really exist, those are out of the picture. Scalia cabined the ability to limit property rights based on 18th century understandings of property law. And in fact, he didn't just limit it based on 18th century property law, he limited it to 18th century courts. If you read the uh, Scalia opinion closely, legislatures can no longer define what a nuisance is. Histor excuse me. Historically, legislators were the ones defining what a nuisance is. No longer. Under Scalia's opinion, the only nuisances that can be considered are those created common law. So his opinion was a very backward-looking opinion that limited how property can be uh, restricted. Most of what the states do today was not a nuisance at common law, although some courts are pretending they are. Uh, the unintended consequence of this, of this opinion is that the notion of common law nuisances grew up a lot. You know, lots of courts held that environmental regulations all of a sudden were common law nuisances. And that's probably a very specious reading of the law. 
Yeah. Everyone getting that so far? Nineteen seventy-seven still wasn't early enough. We're talking about common law principles, um, and that's the weird part of the Scalia law. Usually, when I say notice, if there's a statute passed for a notice, but Scalia said we look to background principles of the common law nuisance. So we're looking to at common law, whenever that was, would it have been a nuisance to build a house by the beach? The answer to that question is clearly no. Therefore, it's taken. Anyone? Hey, He did not overrule Penn Cole. In fact, he tried to define it. He tried to give semblance to it. Like, he, he took Penn Cole and, and gave it more meaning. So Penn Cole is very vague. It just simply said, you know, does it go too far? Scalia said, you want to know when it goes too far? When you are enforcing something that was not a common law nuisance, that's going too far. He kind of gave meaning to it. He said, when you diminish the value too much, and this was not a common law nuisance, taking so he kind of added on top of it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. And that's the weird part of the Scalia opinion. If read literally, almost everything's a taking. But the one restraint, the one reason why it's not as bad as you might think, is that it only applies when there's a complete devaluation of property. So let's put it here. This was the beachfront house. So where complete devaluation, you look to uh, if common law, if it's not a common law nuisance, then taking. So Daniel, to answer your question, Lucas only applies if there's a complete devaluation of property. If I can ask you, what happens if it's less than complete devaluation of property? What, what, what tests do you use then? Yes, everyone understand that? Mahon, I'm sorry, Penn Cole and Lucas will only apply when there's a complete devaluation of property. If it's less than a complete devaluation, we're in Penn Central land. So as you might be able to predict what a courts do, they're going to be very hesitant to find a complete devaluation because then we go into this kind of categorical test where it's very it's very tough. I mean if you think about it, think of Penn Central, the air rights case. If you can't build up, what can you do with those air rights at all? There's absolutely nothing you can do. Maybe jump on the roof or something, you know. Here at least the guy could, you know, go camping and then bring a you know a tent or something. The air rights of a Penn Central are absolutely worthless because he couldn't build anything on top of it. Penn Central is an even stronger case for complete devaluation, yet it still went that way. So what courts end up doing is being very judicious about finding a complete devaluation of property. And in fact, in this case, it was probably based on a really bad factual record. It was not a complete devaluation. It really wasn't. And the reason why was they could still do other stuff on the land. They could still sell it. Uh, the rare cases where there's a complete devaluation, it's usually some land got flooded or maybe... Uh, uh, you know, maybe some regulation dumped sewage on it. Um, there have been cases where the government has dumped, you know, toxic waste on a person's land. That that's that's probably a, a complete devaluation because you can't sell it and you can't live there. Um, there are lots of takings cases about those, but simply telling someone they can't build, different story. So that's the Scalia opinion. Okay. It was probably a lot more. Than needed to be. And the reason why is that over the past, as you can tell from this list, over the past 70 years or so, the takings case law has kind of just bounced back and forth, back and forth. Okay? This case was not with that strenuous dissent. Um, the lead dissent was by Justice Blackman, who was actually the author of the dissent in Loretto. So he lost twice. Uh, let's see, do I give the back row another shot? No? Kristen? What was Justice Black? She, she's nudging you because she probably didn't read last night. Kristen, what, <laughs> Kristen, what, what was the main point of Blackman's dissent? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you, you have a minute to read the answer. I'll say something else. So take take your time, but but you'll be called on in about a minute or two. So the Kennedy concurring opinion, just as Kennedy said, listen, um, nuisance law is far too narrow. This should not be how we're resolving this case. And also, Kennedy said we should resolve this under Penn Central. Okay. Uh, all right, Chris, I'll give you an easier one. What did Justice Souter say in his concurring opinion? Or actually, it wasn't really concurring opinion. What did Justice Souter say? It's like one sentence. Okay. Does anyone know what this means? Dig it. Anyone ever see that before? Dig it, dig. Remember like the little, the, the honey smacks, um, mask was a dig em? The frog, yeah. Dig em. Right, so dis it stands for dismissed as improvidently granted. So we all know when the Supreme Court takes a case that's called granting a writ of petition for certiorari, right? Sometimes, usually once or twice a year, the Supreme Court will say, whoops, my bad, we dismiss it. We should not have granted this petition. In other words, it was improvidently granted. That's a way of saying, whoops, my bad. Um, it happens once or twice a year, but this is a case where a suitor would have digged it. It's dig for short. You dig it. The reason why? The entire finding of the trial court that the value, I'm sorry, the land was worth nothing was probably wrong. It was probably clearly erroneous, in fact. So a suitor would have said, we're not going to touch that. Okay? All right. So now, Kristen. Tell me, what, what did Kennedy, what, what, did, uh, what did Blackman say in his dissent? What was the main point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love these $1 million tents. It's like, you know, it's really, I'm sure it's really reassuring to Mr. Lucas. By the way, Lucas, after this case, wrote a book called like, Lucas versus the Green Machine or Green Monster or something like that, where he basically praised how, how he won. Um, the city ultimately, I think uh, South Carolina ultimately paid the most $800,000 for the land for the taking. So actually, uh, you may not you know, you make that too bad. So Blackman's opinion is very, very strict. He starts off by saying, today the court launched a missile to kill a mouse. In other words, you didn't need to go this far. In Blackman's mind, all you had to do is either apply Penn Central. I realize I keep saying my name, but I'm sorry. Blackman said all you have to do is apply Penn Central, or maybe apply Penn Coal. You don't have to um, do anything new. You don't need any new tests, but the court went very far. In fact, the way the court went too far was actually damaging. I mentioned this before, but historically, the body that defined nuisances was the legislature. Historically, that's how it was done. The Scalia opinion specifically takes out of the hand of the legislature the ability to make new land use laws. Only courts at common law can define what these nuisances are. So now, there can be no change in the law. It's ossified, it's stuck, it's frozen. How are courts supposed to deal with you know, environmental disputes? You know, there wasn't really much environmental law at common law. Excuse me, how are they supposed to deal with zoning issues? That didn't exist very long. How are they supposed to deal with these issues? And the answer is they don't have any power to. Or the real answer is courts have suddenly broadly construed common law powers to include environmental regulations. That's, that's what ended up happening. But the black one is very strict. That the court was, quote, clearly eager to decide this case. Also, black makes a point that Brandeis made, saying, hey, this is police power. There's not even a taking here. Even, even under Penn Central, it doesn't matter. This is a place that gets flooded all the time, and we don't want to put people here because it's dangerous. Now, maybe the city, maybe the state should also demolish the other houses, but it's police power. We're not going to scrutinize it very closely. Okay? He says, quote, there is nothing magical in the reasoning of judges long dead. In other words, who cares what judges hundreds of years thought? We're living in the 20th century. That doesn't matter to us. Um, this must have been a nice barb to Justice Scalia, who has granted most of his uh, judicial philosophy on originalism, which looks to how uh, provisions were understood 200 years ago in interpreting the Constitution. And there are, there are legitimate debates on both sides of that. Okay? 
So that's the Blackman dissent. And one thing just to keep in mind, on the very last sentence, he said, I dissent. Did he usually say, I dissent respectfully, or I respectfully dissent? No R-E-S-P-C-T there. No respect. Find out what it means to me in this class. That was terrible, sorry. There'll be, this, there'll be a column in the evaluations for bad puns. No, you can just give me S in that one. Okay, so Andrew, no? No, okay. Uh, Andrew, what did Justice Stevens say in his dissent? No? No, well, why didn't he like it? Well, uh, I'll give you a second to find the answer. Uh, Stevens and Scalia have a long, long beef. Um, they, they've gone back and forth in many opinions criticizing each other. And in fact, even after Stevens has left the, the bench, he continues to criticize Justice Scalia, saying he's wrong in a number of cases. So these two have no, uh, they're, 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 there's no love lost between these friends. They, they really just don't care for each other. Um, and they continue to barb each other even to this day. Um, what's, Andrew, what's Stevens' main point in the dissent? What do you mean by arbitrary? <laughs> okay, so I, I know what you're getting at, so we'll, we'll ask like this. So, Mark, Stephen says, um, if there's a 100% diminution in value under the Scalia rule, there's a taking, right? But if there's a 95% diminution of value, he gets nothing. Is that right? Is that actually what the law says? Yeah, but I'm asking you, is that, is that actually a fair argument? Because sometimes Stevens makes, you know, not always totally accurate arguments in dissent. When you heard of. No, but, but is it the case that if there's less than 100% diminution, you always get nothing? Well, lo look at our tests. Is it possible with less than a complete diminution of value to get something? No, no. I'm saying if it doesn't go far enough. If it does, if say this is too far and it goes like here. It doesn't quite get there. Anyone, is it feasible for there to be a taking with compensation if there's not a complete devaluation of the property? How? Anyone else? How? Yeah, in the back. Right. So what Stevens is saying is that in cases where the land has been less than 100% diminution, it's impossible to get any kind of money for it. He's also saying there have been cases where there has been a complete devaluation, like the Hadachek case, and there's been no compensation. What's Scalia's response to that? He has two responses, really. Anyone? Good. That's half of the answer. Good. So Stevens makes it seem like if there's less than 100% diminution in value, the landowner's screwed. That's not always the case. If there's less than the complete devaluation, so of Penn Central. So even though we have these categorical tests like Penn Cole and Lucas, where it's going to be very easy to find a taking, if you're not quite there, it doesn't quite go far enough, you have Penn Central. Distinct investment back expectation. Everyone see that? So if there's less than the complete diminution of value, you're not without recourse. You still have Penn Central. It's not much help, but you still have that. But to go to the point which Catherine mentioned, which is exactly correct, there can be a lot of cases, like the Hadachek case, where someone loses the entire value of the property and they get nothing. Scalia basically says tough lumps. There are some cases of winners and losers. 
that you're not going to always find fair cases with takings. And I think that's largely due to the fact that the takings power is so closely bound up with the police power. And depending how we characterize each case, it can go either way. Let's say Loretto. The court found there was a taking there, but if you ask Blackman in dissent, he would have just said, no, it's not a taking. This is a police power. We want to make sure people have access to cable television. This is simply police power. Let's go to Havacek. The court fair found there that this was police power. You could have easily found that it was a taking, saying, listen, this guy had a property. It was pre-existing. He was in operation for years before. You took his entire business away from him. Taking. Okay? Let's look at Penn Central. The majority said, no, 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 no. This is not a taking because, you know, this is just a regulation of part of it. They still can run the trains underneath it. Or the dissent said, that's absolutely a taking. You've taken the entire value of their air rights and turned it to zero. Or even the Lucas case, you can look at it both ways, saying, listen, it's a taking because this guy had value, he wants to build a house, or it's police power. We don't want, to see, we don't want people building houses in the water that are going to flood it. Every one of these cases can be easily characterized as either a taking or police power, depending on how you characterize the interest. And that's why these cases are so difficult to kind of grasp because there's really no coherent rule. This back and forth between Scalia and Stevens is largely a product of how they view property rights. Stevens is more likely to view property rights through the lens of the state, saying, how can this be used for the common good? Scalia is more likely to view it in the life of the individual, saying, hey, he wants to build a million-dollar beachfront house, and now he's being forced to pitch a tent. And that's, not, that's no fun. Right? That's why these cases are so tricky to understand. Even something as simple as, is there a complete devaluation of the property defense and what the denominator is? This is the point we keep making. Is the land totally valueless? Is it totally valueless in the mind of the owner of the property? Is it uh, valueless in the mind of the, uh, the judge or in the state? Who's defining value? What's the denominator? That's why these cases are something of a mess. And they're kind of hard to to wrap your heads around because they go all over the place. And it gets even worse on Monday when we do the next line of cases, which further retract it. You know, this case was 1992 with Scalia and the majority and Stevens in dissent. The case you'll read for Monday flips it. Stevens has a majority and Scalia is in dissent. And it goes totally mishmash. Okay. And if you know Stevens respectfully dissented, he usually does. He doesn't usually uh, uh, stick it to him. I think Blackman retired a year or two after that. He, was, he gets getting very bitter in his old age. Uh, by the way, his name's M-U-N, not spelled like mine. I feel so weird saying it over and over again. Uh, but fortunately, there's not too many cases from him in this class. Yes, sir. So going too far, so that is complete loss of value. Is that? Well, Holmes never said when too far was too far. If you read Scalia's interpretation of Holmes, he said when it loses all value. That's Scalia's interpretation. But the opinion by Holmes never actually said when it goes too far. What Holmes did say in the case with the coal, that there was complete diminution of value. So you could, so you could read the opinion as saying going too far means a complete diminution, but he didn't say that. In other words, say like complete diminutions here, and then too far is here. For Holmes, it wouldn't really matter where too far was because we know the complete diminution was to the right of it. Okay, that makes sense? And the Scalia opinion added the further wrinkle that when it's a complete devaluation, it's only a taking if it's not based on these common law principles. So Scalia added what we call a gloss on top of Penn Coal. He added that additional wrinkle. So you kind of have to read three and five together. But again, this will become even more confusing on Monday when you read the next case. Um, I would really like, did, did you do this case in, in con law? No? By the way, the, um, the, the day students, I asked them, they had Elfini for con law. They didn't do any of these cases. They were, they were, they were the good class. Okay. This is a tricky case um, with a lot of really, really deep issues. Um, Everyone get it okay? Any questions? Yeah? No? Okay. Yes? Yeah, I thought it was a tell. So, when we're looking at this, we talk about just 
sort of merge and pull and read this together? Try to read them together. I think that, that makes more sense. But again, this is Scalia's gloss on Penn Cole. In other words, if you just read Penn Cole in class last week, you wouldn't have gotten all this. So, but we now have this other precedent interpreting it. So where there's a complete loss of value, under Lucas, we look to if there's a common law nuisance. Um, and I don't want you to focus too much on this yet, because we have one more class to go where it's going to change a little bit more. Right. But as far as this goes, yes. So, so basically, you have to figure out first is it Penn Cole and then Penn Central, and then we get a whole year to unpack all the papers. Right. Yeah. The right. easier one, if there's a, if there's less than it, I mean, let's look at it this way, right? And maybe we can do it like this. So, um, so if there's a physical invasion, you're in Loretto land, right? If there's a non-physical invasion, you're either in Penn Coal or Penn Central. So then if it's a complete, sorry, if it's less than complete devaluation, you do Penn Central. If it's a complete devaluation, or it goes too far, it's Penn Coal. Is that what you're thinking? Is that, that, that flow, everyone get that? So make this like, you know, and again, we're going to do more stuff on Monday to make it even more confusing. So I don't want you to get married to this yet. Um, this should be like A. Or even just ask for a dance. Coffee. OK. Everyone get that? So the easier one's going to be Loretto. If there's a physical invasion, that's easy. That's Loretto. OK? <laughs> If it's not physical, then you have to look at Penn Central or, or Penn Coal. And then depending on how far the devaluation goes. Now, even in your own studies, probably everyone in this room will define the devaluation differently. And that's fine, because the judges do it exactly the same way. So don't get too hung up if you think it's complete devaluation or partial devaluation. But at least recognize that it's going to be either of those two tests. Yeah, regulatory takings is a total morass. Yes. Well, Lucas is really a subset of Penn Coal because Lucas then adds the, the nuisance gloss. Because nuisance, Lucas says, if there's a complete devaluation and at common law this was not a nuisance, then there's a taking. Because with Lucas, if it was a nuisance at common law, then it can be, uh, can be regulated without paying compensation. All right. Yes, let me answer that question on Monday, okay? There's, there's, a, there's, another, there's another couple, several cases on Monday that make it even worse. So just, just ask this flow chart for a dance, don't marry it. Um, and there's really no good way of teaching it because the Supreme Court has muddled this up real bad. Uh, and you guys have to s suffer through it. Okay, but everyone get this far. We'll, we'll take this step by step and you'll get every step and hopefully We'll figure this out. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So the next case we're doing is from Rhode Island. Pala, uh, Palazala. You want to say Palazzi, and I know that's that's not the right one. Here we go. Uh, So where are we up to? I did mark. Uh, Katie. Okay, I'll call you in a second, okay? Come on, computer. No. Can you look to log in again? So the Palazzolo case came from Rhode Island and involved somewhat similar fact patterns involving building uh, each front property. Did anyone ever actually go to this website? No? Do you not have this website? They don't give you a password? I think. Is it dukeminiorproperty.com? That's it. 
Oh, I guess you just have to click on it. Okay. No, no, no. It, it, this is minier-property.com. I think it's in the that little insert thing. Professor? That's me. I gave it to you about two months ago. Yeah. I, I, oh, I put it on the board. I definitely did. Oh no way! You have it written on the board. No, on the computer. Um, oh, uh, okay. I don't have it handy. I, I, I don't have it saved in my browser, but I will give it to you. It won't help you much. with just some pictures. Now don't worry about it. Basically, anyway. So this is the site. This site, and as you can tell, this land frequently gets flooded. Um, Katie, just just roughly, what are the facts? Because we're not going to spend too much time in this case. But I want to make sure you have sufficient time for your evaluation. A little bit earlier. So, what, what are roughly the facts of this case? Good. Okay, so this is actually not much different than the case we just did a minute ago. Guy wants to build by the beach. State said you can't. There are some complicated wrinkles with the fact that there's a corporation and the shares are transferred and some of them knew about it or not. Don't, don't bother with that. This stuff's muddled enough as it is. Um, uh, Daniel, what's then the biggest difference between this case and the uh, Lucas case we just did a few minutes ago? The one I told you not to get married to. No, you're on the right track. Yeah, the trial court said it was. What did the Supreme Court say? Nice. Okay. So in the last case, we had facts that were almost identical. We had beachfront property that could not be built upon. Scalia said this is a complete taking. Palazzolo said, no, it's not, because you can still go camping. So that's why I was urging that don't get too married to this case because it's not good. The Palazzolo case, and I can maybe make this you know, a variation, like 5A, Palo, whatever. Palazzolo, uh, denial of the beachfront, uh, uh, moratorium on the beachfront, uh, I can't type, beachfront is not complete loss. Everyone see that? So all the court did was it said, even though you can't build by the beach, it's not a complete loss. If you remember, the opinion from the Supreme Court and Lucas was based on the trial court's findings that there was a complete devaluation of property. The Supreme Court never found that by itself. They just assumed that that trial court was correct. Here, they simply said, no, there's not a complete devaluation of property. Why? Because you can still do other stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can go camping, you can go hunting, you can do whatever you want. So that was the limitation of this holding. And uh, Chase, in light of the fact that it's not a complete taking, I'm sorry, it's not a complete devaluation of property, what test should be applied in the remand? Right. Everyone see why that is? So, the Lucas case was a really big deal for like, I don't know, like a decade, then not so much. Because courts were able to peel it back and limit it. So now Lucas will only apply when there's a complete devaluation of property. And you can't use anything for it. And the case we're going to do in a couple days limits even more. So this is a very nice flow chart, but don't focus on it too much. That's why I focus on Penn Cole, because that's still the test, and the meaning of Penn Cole is questionable. Okay? That's all I want to take away from Paolo Zalo case, because it was in there just briefly to show you how the court reigned back Lucas. Okay, everyone get that? Yes, sir. Well, that would go to the Dibbies, the distinct investment backed expectations. On remand under Penn Central, that would show that this guy didn't really have really big expectations for the land, he let it sit forever. Whereas in the uh, Lucas case in South Carolina, he wants to build right away. And he had very strong expectations. Yep. Yeah? All right. Any questions on that case?
All right, I have the evaluations. Who wants to be a very good student and bring these up because I can't touch them? Okay, yeah, that's right. Um, so take your time with these. Uh, I like to go even earlier than usual so you have time to not delay it. Um, 627, just bring them out. And I will uh, see you guys on Wednesday. I'm sorry, next, uh, I'll say on Monday. Yeah, I mean, that'll be the last substantive class you have with me. God. It's been fun. Uh, I don't remember. Email me uh, if you want to come, and I can, I'm sure I'll make a time. It's, uh, the office hours are on the syllabus. I don't remember what they are. But, um, I don't. I think it's. Monday from 7.30 to 8.30. Yep. And Wednesday from 7.30 Yep. Yeah, and if you need to email me, I can usually find the time. I don't usually even know what time that's also on my calendar. <laughs>